All right. Well, good afternoon, brethren. We're going to talk a little bit about something that definitely is connected to the day of Pentecost, this great day of the future that God commands us to commemorate and to keep all the days of our life after he opened our mind that we could know him and know his plan. And definitely Pentecost has a very important part in the plan of God. I think it has maybe a lot more significance in some ways than we fully realize. There's so many things. God's plan is so great and so big. I know we only see it in part. We may yearn to, to know more about that plan. And that's why we have to keep pursuing the Word of God. And so as we do and do it in the right heart, God will bless us. He really will. So <clears throat> Fred always starts in Leviticus 23. Well, I'll let him do that if he wants. Um, I'm just going to highlight. Now, you know in Leviticus 23... It's the only place where God, in sequence, points out every major part of his plan as far as an outline. He doesn't give all the details by any means, but it does. So what does it do? He starts with the Sabbath. He goes to the Passover. And then he goes to unleavened bread. And then what is next? And as Fred has alluded to, a, a great deal of space is, is listed right there about the wave sheaf offering and the first fruits. Well, do you think that that is an indication of how important it is to God? Pentecost pictures the first resurrection it pictures the harvest of the first fruits. Now, the first fruits are very important to God, or he would not spend that much time on it, and it would not be in the order that it's in. I mean, God, he can bring salvation to men whenever he wants to, but he has a very specific purpose for the first fruits, and that's why it's so important. So, I'm going to talk on, a, 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 well, you can turn to 1 Peter, because that's where I'm going to spend most of my time. I'm not going to jump around a lot. Anyway, we're in 1 Peter chapter 4. And in verse 17, what does he say? For the time has come for judgment. Judgment. That word conjures up a many different things to the human mind. Because judgment, think of all the different aspects of judgment that people fear. They really do fear. And a lot of people in their heart, even though they're not close to God, they don't know God, but they may believe in God. But in their lifetime, there are times when they fear the judgment of God because they know how they've lived and they're not quite sure if God is going to have mercy upon them. And so judgment does conjure up things. But what does it say here? For judgment to begin with the household of God. It doesn't say judgment for all mankind, and it's not. What Peter is talking about here is the first time of judgment for salvation in the church of God. And that is why it is so important for us to understand. What is it in this time of judgment? And we are in that time of judgment. When God called us, I don't care whether he called you when you were 18 or when you were 65, or older, or somewhere in between. When he called you and opened your mind, that's when our judgment began. When we did not turn and run away 
and say, no, I don't want this. And of course, some did. And some waited a while, and then they turned away. But we're still here, and we are in judgment. That first time of judgment for salvation. And he goes on, he says, if it first begins with us, well, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel? And the world wonders about that and wonders about that, and they don't have the answer because their mind is blind and they are not truly seeking it in the way they should if, because if they did, they too could understand it much better in spite of the blindness. And so the plan of God takes care of that. And then in 18, he says, if the righteous be saved with much difficulty, have you ever felt like your judgment was too much? I'm sure you have. We all have at times. And those times when you thought, I cannot take any more, what did you do? Well, if you're still here, if you're still faithful, I know what you did. You turned to God. As hard as it was maybe at that time, because your mind was upon the difficulty. But when you turn to God, what does he do? He promises, absolutely promises, that he will then. If you turn to him, and if you ask him for the help that you need, then he will help. And as Fred alluded to a bit ago, he will lead you out of that difficulty. Now there is another judgment coming. And I, I may speak of that or, or not, but right now, let's look at the word much difficulty. And it is a true judgment period that has many tests and many trials. So why don't we go back to verse 1 where Peter says, Consequently, since Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Now that brings up a number of things. Christ is not expecting us. Well, first, who is Christ? Hasn't God the Father given all judgment unto Christ? And what did Christ do? He came here below and went through suffering as no man has really known. Through the course, the whole course of it. No man has really known that. Sure, men have gone through many things. But he came here, our creator. He was willing to become a human being and to go through what he did that the plan of God could go forward. And it could not work any other way. But Christ suffered in the flesh for us and eventually for all of mankind, because the plan of God covers that. But he was willing to do that while we were what? Still living our life in the world, living in sin as the people around us. I don't care what variation, we were still living in sin. And so he was willing to do that. Well, what does he expect of us. Well, Peter says right here, he says, arm yourself with the same mind, the same mind that Christ had when he was going through his judgment. And that's exactly what we have to do. Philippians says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And so, that is part of what is expected of us. Because Christ suffered, we have to suffer. And it says, because the one who has suffered in the flesh has finished living in sin. Well, we are not sinless, and we better not say we are. God says we would be a liar, and there'd be no liar in the kingdom of God. But we are striving to not sin. And when we do, what do we do? We have to repent. 
And that is in the will of God, and that is in the plan of God. That we have to suffer, and when we stumble, we have to repent, and he will then forgive us. And to this end, and you can read these verses in first person. So, we no longer live our remaining time in the flesh to the lusts of men like we did before, you see. That's what that verse is saying. Verse 2, For in times past, our lives are sufficient to have worked out the will of the Gentiles. What does that mean? Well, because we were like them. And all of his people, Israel, actually, you see. That's why he had to eventually divorce them and create the new covenant. Covenant with people that the Father would call. Call to what? Call to a time of judgment. That's what we're talking about. But in times past, no, we didn't know. We didn't know until the Father opened our mind. And that's why then our whole life changes. You can think of people that you were close to before God called you. A short time ago, between two and three weeks, Sherry and I had to go to a, well, they call it a uh, celebration of life, of people that die. Celebration of life. Well, I've had to go to that more than one time with other people. And I'm always sitting there like I was this time sitting there squirming in my seat because of the things that they say. And you just want to get up and, and say, hey, <laughs> you want to get up and you want to tell it the way God does in his word. But uh, they would probably usher you to the door. <laughs> they would do that. But I, I first met this man in 1960 when I had to come to California to find a job. And I met him very shortly after, and we, we connected, because at the time we were really on the same page. He believed in God, I believed in God, and we lived our life accordingly. We, it doesn't mean we, <laughs> and we were living it without sin, but I mean, we were able to do things together and, and really, really be close friends. Well, about five years after that, God called me. He opened my mind. Well, right at first, I did mention it to him and his wife. And, and I said, hey, you, you need to listen. <laughs> and so on, and they they maybe did listen a time or two and decided, hmm, I don't, <laughs> you know, they, they weren't going to buy this, and they still wanted to be my friend. But there was this big guillotine division that came right down between us, and we no longer could be friends like before. And you've, most all of you have experienced that. It, we were separated. Now, God did the separating, and God was not, why? Well, he did it for the purpose, because he wanted you. He wanted me, or he wouldn't have called us. And when we responded, then that petition came up, and while I got to see, I got to see Ray Joe about, well, he turned 96, and on that day, he wanted to see me, and so I went over and spent a wonderful two hours going over old things with him. And it was still there. We, we were friends. We, we were of the same heart, in part. He simply did not have the knowledge that has been given to me by God. And you can't bring that up. You only offend then at that point. So you try to cover things in a way that one day they 
hopefully, and I'm sure they will remember. And that will be a wonderful thing. But you see, we know that and they don't. So he died and went, uh, we went to the event that they had. But that's what we were called to. We were called to judgment now. They were not. Does that mean they were all bad and evil people? Well, they had certainly human nature, as Jeremiah 17 tells us. But there's a lot of difference in how people live their lives. And they receive blessings from God automatically as a result. If they live a better life that is in line with the, with the Word of God, they will be blessed for it even though they will not be, unless God calls them, in the first resurrection. And those are the things that we need to keep in mind. Let's go to verse 12. Peter said, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial. Well, we've just talked some about that. We may touch a little more. The fiery trial among you, which is taking place, what? Yes, to test us. You see, God, well, God knows all things. And God knows us. That's why he called us. He saw something that we do not know for sure. But he saw it, and he decided to call us. All right, we're in judgment. But why, then, does he promise and you learned that shortly after you were called. I know I did, and I'm sure most of you did. You learned that it was going to be difficult. Well, what does that mean? Trials, tests, what do they conjure up? Well, it, it, it is difficult. It is a difficult, and it's a test. And he says right here, which is taking place. Don't be surprised as if it were some strange thing that is happening to you. No, it's God's will. God knows we have to be tried and tested. And you can think back to our forefather, Abraham. And we know that story by heart, right? Starts in verse 12 where God called him. And it goes all the way to 22 and then beyond. But what happened there? In 22, after all the things that Abraham had done, and it said that he, it was accounted to him for righteousness because he believed God. He believed him, and therefore he did what God told him. Well, that's exactly what God wants with us. But after all those things that Abraham did, and then God said, nope, one more time. And he asked him to take that son, that promised son, and to actually kill him as a sacrifice. And he was willing to do it. And at that point, you know what God said. Now I know. I don't think that God has said that about us yet. If he has, <laughs> well, that's great. But I don't think he has. We don't know what we're going to face. We look at all these things going on around us today that are absolutely beyond the pale. And they are so insane that we say, how could this be? Now, we know in part, but we ask it anyway. We say, how can this be? Well... Because things aren't over yet. That's why. And these things have to come to pass, as the Word of God shows. And we are learning more and more about that, and we can understand that things are going to come to pass. But we have to be tested. All right, verse 13. But to the degree that you have a share in the sufferings of Christ, and that gets right back to verse 1. Christ suffered, we also have to suffer. That is the way God wants it, so that we can become true brethren with Christ. 
And Christ does look at us whom the Father has given him as his brother. And he even calls us his brother. But we have to be seeking to obey him. So he says rejoice. Well, that is difficult, we know. But we are thankful that we understand that we have to go through it and not drop out like some did. Way too many that I have known dropped out. They went along good for a while. And then things did not happen the way they wanted. And they got offended or some other thing. And the longer they thought about it, the worse it got until suddenly they were not there. They turned back. And that is unthinkable. I mean, to us now, isn't that unthinkable? You bet it is. We're in this with our whole life. What is our life? What is our life in this world? It's nothing, especially if you're as old as Fred. Uh, <laughs> well, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit behind. <laughs> but no, and when you look at what they're doing in this world and what they're doing to our children and, and how they are absolutely destroying our children in so many ways, physically and spiritually. What does this world have to offer? It doesn't. It really doesn't. Now, you, some of you younger people, some of you, yes, I know, it's easier to get your mind on things you want to do in the world. That is in a human being. But trust me, when you get as old as I, if you ever do, it won't matter anymore. It just won't matter. And so we have to look at what God offers and what does he offer us. Well, it is absolutely amazing. We cannot fully inculcate it, but it is real, and it will come to pass if we're faithful, if we suffer now and be willing to. And when they come after us, if they come to our door, and we don't know what will happen, that's up to God at that point, absolutely up to God. But those kinds of things will happen in this nation, other nations around the world where God's people are. And so we ain't seen anything yet, so to speak. But that, that's the way it is. Well, I want to turn back to James a little bit. Because James, it's really amazing how God's word goes together, and you know that. I'm not telling you anything new today. I guess I'm doing what Peter has always mentioned. He was telling them that they would remember when they went over what he wrote to them. Well, one of the first words out of James' mouth when he starts his epistle, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you are beset by various trials. Didn't Peter just say that? Well, there it is. So we have to get the right perspective upon trials because they are necessary. How many times have you woken up to what you had done? Maybe just done. Maybe it took a few days or even a few weeks before you realized what you'd done. And then you were crestfallen because you realized that it was absolutely wrong. Well, what'd you do? You had to repent. And so then you realize, you realize why tests come. They can come from many sources. And Satan is behind so many of them. Satan is accusing us to God, just like he did Job. I am sure he is accusing us every time we mess up in any day. 
He is accusing us. That's why Christ is our intercessor. He is running intercession for us to the Father. Why? Because he had to be here below in the human flesh with human nature and go through the trials he went through so that he could empathize with those that the Father would call in this time of judgment. In this time. Verse 3, James 1, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now the very word endurance conjures up difficulty, doesn't it? If you're really going to endure something difficult, you know you're going to have to apply your whole heart and mind to it. And what does Christ say to the seven churches, every one of them? He who endures to the end. The end is not here yet. My feeling is very close, but it is not here yet. And he says, to him who overcomes every one of those tests, every one of those trials, that is the one that I will give a place in my house, in my family, as my son or daughter. That's what he says. And we have to remind ourselves of that all the time. And the harder it gets, the more we put our nose right here in the Word of God. Because that is where we get true help. God's not going to call down from Mount Zion and talk to us. If you, if you run into anybody who says God talks to them, well, um, it's best to kind of distance yourself. He's not going to do that. How does he talk to us? Paul says in Hebrews, he says right there in chapter 1, he says he talks to us through his word. That's where it is. That's why we have it. That's why we have to study it. So, I want to end in Hebrews. Now that I mentioned, let's go to Hebrews, and we'll go to chapter 2. Well, let's start in verse 14. Therefore, since the children are partakers of flesh and blood, in like manner, he also took part in the same. And I have just covered that. In order that through death he might annul him who has the power of death. Satan the devil. Before he could begin his ministry. You know there in Math Matthew and Luke 4.4. 4, he had to... He had to be tested face to face. And we have no, we, we cannot really understand the pressure that was upon him at that time because he knew that if he sinned even once, he was in the flesh or he knew he was in the flesh. He hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights or drank any water. And he knew he was in the flesh. And he knew if he sinned, it was all over. The plan of God could not go forward. And therefore, he did have to take part in the same. That he might annul the power of Satan. And when that day comes, and that is another major part of God's plan, when the great atonement comes and Satan is locked up, then the plan of God can go forward in a very, very wonderful way. And it'll go all the way to the end. And so, in verse 17, he says, For this reason, it was obligatory for him, Christ, to be made like his brethren in everything that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest. Jude says, God sanctifies us through Christ. And he gives us 
to Christ, to shepherd. Christ is the great shepherd, and he shepherds those that the Father calls, the way the Father wants him to, that he made like the brethren, that he can be a merciful, faithful high priest in things pertaining to God in order to make propitiation for the sins of the people. But he was willing to do that. For because he himself has suffered before we have had to truly suffer, he had to do that in able to help those who are being tempted and tried and in judgment now. Our judgment is not over, brethren. It is not. It will not be until our last breath or on that glorious day when the first fruits of God who have gone through judgment and were faithful are raised to glory. And that glory will be to God Almighty who has called us. So let's fight the good fight.